We're no. talking about the internet right. and the United Nations potentially getting involved in sort of overseeing the internet. You know, this this is sounds crazy and and it is. But this week, the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Washington D.C. is going to debate whether or not to allow the United Nations or some group in the United Nations to regulate the internet in the United States, including who has the right to turn it off. Correct, including what can be taken down because it's found offensive. China's pushing for this, where the Chinese government does this. Yeah, Russia is pushing for this, where figures. the Russian government does it. Why should the House of Representatives even consider this? It is so obviously violative of our First Amendment freedoms in this country. Well, currently, the Internet here in the United States is regulated by nobody. Correct. It is the Wild West. You can say what you want. If you harm someone as a result of what you say, the person can sue you. Right. But the government doesn't stop you from saying it. President Obama has claimed that in an emergency, he can shut down the Internet. I only know of one instance in which a government shut down the Internet in recent times, and that's the city of San Francisco, when the Occupy Wall Street crazies were in the subway, were in the Bay Area rapid transit. Right. Or during the Arab Spring, there have been a number of countries who, that have tried to shut down Twitter because people Egypt. would... Egypt. Iran. Yeah, they'd wind up uh, organizing a flash mob, be at the square, Tahrir Square, 15 minutes, boom, right. 50,000 right. people. Look, the Internet is just speech. And the beauty of it is it's utterly unregulated. You can say what you want. You can talk to whomever you want. You don't have to worry about the government. You don't have to worry about anybody stopping you. Alternatively, though, you know, you do have these, these, these wannabe terrorists who are going on and they're looking on the Internet and they're getting information from the Internet on how to build bombs and how to, you know, carry out certain attacks. So there is, there is you, you can understand why people would want some sort of regulation. You understand why people want, you know, the, the pedophiles to be somehow regulated or not, at least... Not uh, too long ago, somebody was prosecuted uh, for reading a book about how to make a bomb. Right. They got the book from a library owned by the government. So how can the same government that owns a library that has this book in it prosecute people mm -hmm. for reading it? You don't prosecute people for speech or for reading. You prosecute them when they actively commit a crime. That's the difference. That's why the inter Internet should stay right. free. And that's why the House of Representatives shouldn't even be considering I don't get this. That. Well, well, do you think anything's going to happen with this? Do you think it's actually? Oh, I think I think it it'll it'll fail. Uh, uh, the majority on both sides is against it. But every time the United Nations runs something, they don't do a very good job at it. Well, so uh, why run the internet? It seems to be working okay right now. I, I guess that there are elements in the State Department that are trying to do a favor to their colleagues in China and Russia, saying, "Yeah, we'll put this on the, on the table and see where it goes. It should go down a black hole and stay there." All right, Judge uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, Fox is. Uh, senior judicial analyst. Well, those red light cameras are used in hundreds of cities across the country to catch drivers breaking the law. But some people are concerned these cameras can violate your rights to due process. And now a Missouri court is the latest to rule those cameras are unconstitutional. Judge Andrew Napolitano is a Fox News senior judicial analyst and joins us now. Judge, yeah. raise your right hand. Raise my hand. Have you ever gotten caught by one of these cameras? No, I never have. Okay. Just and, need to and, check because if you, you know, I, I honestly all. don't know what I would do. I would I would probably challenge it, but as we were talking in the break, the cost of the challenge you have to hire a lawyer, then you have to hire a computer expert, then you have to get the equipment and examine the equipment. The cost of doing that is far more than the fine, the $125, $130 that you'd pay. So let's talk a little bit about the due process part of this. In, okay. in, in Missouri, specifically, the due process was at issue? Yes. That's what the courts had a, yes, had a the, problem with. Yes, the procedure that I just described to you about a lawyer and a computer expert is what would happen if I got caught with this in New Jersey, where you can challenge it. In St. Louis, you couldn't challenge it. You were just getting a bill from the city as if it was an additional tax bill, and people were uniformly paying them. And then people started saying, well, what are these bills for? It was for because a camera, a camera, not a human being, a camera, said that you went through a stoplight. Well, so people challenged it, and just late last week, a judge in St. Louis said, it's unconstitutional. It doesn't keep us safe. It's just a cheap way to raise more money, and you didn't give people a fair trial. Well, some say it is a way to keep us safe. If you look at some statistics, and you have to consider the source for this, but the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety says in cities that use these cameras, injuries are down, uh, reduced by 29%, double digits, and that, that the roads are safer because of the cameras. So how does that interplay with then our rights so as citizens 
to get the due process you're because mentioning. Because our rights as citizens to due process are natural rights that come from our, our humanity and they're protected by the Constitution of Missouri and all the other 49 states as well as the federal constitution and the police can't take those rights away by saying pay up you have the right to challenge to demonstrate that you didn't go through a red light or that the camera was rigged as was the case in san diego to take a picture of you before the light actually turned red and then pretend that you were in the intersection so when the it, light it was wasn't red. automatic if you didn't automatically get that bill in the mail then would your due process would you have due process if they said okay we caught you on camera we're inviting you to court to explain yourself before we levy this fine based on the evidence no we charge you with going through a red light and we're going to prosecute you and attempt to prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt and among the evidence we're going to use is this photograph so you can come in and defend yourself against the photograph you don't have to prove that you didn't drive the car through the red light the government has to prove that you did and the photograph is just one element of the proof and they have to prove that the camera was accurate so you think then they also are... have to prove that they had the authority to put the camera up there in so, the first place do you think these cameras nationwide are unconstitutional. I think they're they're just a gimmick to raise money for local governments. And I'm not the only one who thinks that way. The city of San Diego lost a hundred million dollars to people that it had illegally fined and to the companies from whom it had bought the cameras before it decided to get rid of them. I only I only have a quick moment here, but how does this apply to other crimes that could potentially be caught on camera and observed by a camera like the traffic camera? Or even listened to because some of these cameras have microphones in them. We have we haven't gotten there yet, but that's coming. So if it takes a picture of you in the car and there's something on the front seat of the car that you didn't expect would be in the photograph, can they use that photograph to prosecute you? Probably not, but they'll try. Judge, nice Jenna, to see you. Drive safely. Always a pleasure. Cameras or not. I will drive safely, Judge. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. John, will you drive safely? I, I drive safely, question. but I hate those cameras. <laughs> I hate them. You mean you drive safely no matter what those cameras that's, say? That's right. That's right, Judge. I'm with you there. With us now to break down the so-called kill list, Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. And Judge, you probably heard Ed's report there. I mean, the White House is coming back saying this is justified, and the White House has always been kind of on this court. Look, the, on this path, rather. The, the justification here is we kill them because they're liable to kill us if we don't. Your thoughts? Well, when the Attorney General, uh, Eric Holder, attempted to justify this a couple of months ago uh, at Northwestern University Law School, his speech was widely panned because he suggested that uh, somehow the Constitution authorizes this, that the requirement in the Fifth Amendment for due process of law, basically a fair trial before someone who's not engaged in actually shooting at our soldiers can be killed by the president, can be substituted for by the careful secret deliberation that the president president engages in. And then when people at that speech asked him for a copy of the legal research on which he based these outrageous and unprecedented claims, he said, it's a secret. I can't share it with you. So the government is essentially having it both ways. It's saying we can do this because the law allows it, but our reasoning is secret and we can't let, let you do it. Baloney. The law simply does not allow the president to kill whoever he wants from a yearbook. He can only kill people if we declare war on that country and their soldiers from the country or if they're actually actively engaged in killing us. Mm. So, but the president vowed, look, he, in, Ed Henry was saying in 2008 campaign, he vowed to fight al-Qaeda using U.S. morals. And, and a lot of people have said, Judge, so U.S. morals say no torture, but U.S. morals say it's okay to blow somebody up. Well, the president is hardly known uh, for consistency. He has radically changed his views. George W. Bush, whatever you think of his presidency, did not come close to anything like this. And yet the values espoused by President Bush were, were aggressively attacked by then uh, Senator Obama. When he gets into the White House, he takes what President Bush did and extends it exponentially uh, into this uh, killing whoever he wants to kill. Look, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison would be turning in their graves if they thought that the Constitution that they brought forth permitted the president to become a killer. It doesn't. It's wrong. It's against our values. It's unlawful. It's unconstitutional. And the Congress should do something about it. But, but the but judge at the same time, a lot of people are saying, look, they're taking out some awfully bad actors. And if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. The Constitution simply does not put into the hands of one person 
the president, the decision to decide whom to kill when he killed Anwar Al-Awlaki, who was born in New Mexico, and his 16-year-old son, who was born in New Mexico, and their friend, who was born in Virginia. He crossed a line that most Americans can contemplate, because if the president can kill Americans on his own say-so, then the Constitution means nothing. Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge, great to see you, sir. Thank you. Trace, whatever we talk about, it's a pleasure to be with you, my friend. <laughs> Thanks, Judge. Good to see you. This story's gotten a ton of attention this week from the classroom to the slammer. New outrage over a Texas judge's ruling that jailed this 17 year old honor student for missing too much school, essentially, but we're going to clarify that in a moment. Now, Diane Tran reportedly worked two jobs to support her family, and her lawyer says that she missed some days because of exhaustion from working two jobs to support her siblings and her family. Now, the teenager. Uh, now has, as a result of this, a criminal record. She spent 24 hours behind bars, and she was fined $100. Here now, Judge Andrew Napolitano, Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst, to hash all this out with us a little bit. Judge, yeah, what, what do you make of this? It, it, it seems completely unreasonable, given the situation. Well, well, it is unreasonable, and we ought to correct what is a public uh, misconception here. She was not jailed for truancy. She was not jailed for failing to go to school. Texas statutes do not authorize incarceration for that. She was jailed for violating the judge's order. If you don't go back to school, if you miss 10 days, I'm going to put you in jail for violating my order. So she order. had been brought before the court initially, and then he Correct. said, you need to go to school. We have to figure out a way to make sure that you're in school. And, and if you, she violated that, and therefore it was contempt of court. Correct. So it was contempt of court that triggered the one day in jail on the $100 fine. But the big picture is, well, what kind of sense does it make to put a student who's about to graduate, who you want to go to school, in jail where she can't go to school? Uh, this decision was made by this judge, and it's very controversial. It's not one that I would have made, but of course I don't have all the information before me that he had. Now, if you'll permit a little bit of an editorial, this is a wacky system. This judge, according to his bio, is a high school graduate only. He is not a graduate of a college or of a law school. But Texas law permits high school graduates to wield judicial power if they can get elected as a justice of the peace. That means they lack the professional credentialing and academic education one would expect of a judge. In this case, it, perhaps the inability to use actual judgment in this case, separating Correct. this student and give, bearing in mind the rest of her qualifications and her personal situation. However, if the judge did, you know, if she came before the judge and, and he said, you need to go to school, we need to figure out a, a, a way that we can make this work with your life, and then that was violated again, it sounds to me, just to play devil's advocate here for a moment, that he was trying to make a point with this young but, lady. But the punishment should consist of something other than keeping her out of school yet again. It seems I mean, the reason she's there is because she hasn't gone to school. What does he do? Sends her to jail so she can't go to school again. There are other techniques available to the court that would have induced compliance with his order. Stated differently, he shouldn't have sent her to jail. He should have sent her to school and worried about punishing her later after she graduates. And then maybe if she had complied with this order, there'd be right. no need for punishment. And one of the biggest concerns is this criminal record, of course. This honor student who feels that she's been, you know, a good student and a virtuous member of the community doesn't want to have that. Correct. She can't sue the judge because she can't sue judges for what they do in their official capacity. She can appeal the contempt uh, conviction. If it's overturned, then there's still a record that this happened, but it's a record of acquittal. She can also move under Texas law to have it expunged, that is, removed from the record. Both the appeal and the application for expungement will be before real judges who really went to law school and were lawyers before they got their black robes. Just minor details, <laughs> Judge. Law degree. What the big... Thank you, sir. Even Hammer agrees with me on that <laughs> one. Yeah. Thank you, Judge. There's certainly a lot of critics of the mayor's plan. Look at Judge Napolitano. You call him Mother Bloomberg. I do. But before you get into your personal opinion on this, which is why we invited you on, of course, as yes. well as your legal opinion, is it actually legal for a mayor to do this? No. It's not legal because this would have a profound effect on interstate commerce, and interstate commerce under the Constitution can only be regulated by the Congress. Effectively, the mayor is taking the largest commercial uh, base in the country, New York City, and saying a certain product, absolutely lawful, cannot come into the city, cannot be sold in the city, and cannot, in, can, cannot be moved in commerce in the city. That usurps the role of the Congress. Second. 
What's with the 16 ounces? Oh, well, let's show everybody what okay, 16 so ounces Okay, so 16 is. ounces is Judge, okay. You, there we go, 16 ounces. This and is, and we, 17 we ounces an argument, is not? By the way, if I, <laughs> we had an argument in the studio because everyone looked at this and said, that's not 16 ounces, that's like 12 ounces. No, that's actually 16 ounces. So this would be allowed, but anything bigger would not be allowed. Although they say if you want to go get refills of your 16 ounces, you can go ahead and do See, that. See, the government can't be arbitrary. It can't say something works at 16 but doesn't work at 17 unless there's a basis but, for it saying but that. But doesn't other the government... Than the Opinion. Set a speed limit, for example? I mean, aren't there certain restrictions that a government very, arbitrarily Very makes? good question. Before the Congress set the speed limits, the Congress held a lot of hearings and looked at a lot of studies about how safe automobiles would go. It evaluated the miles per gallon and the safety of passengers. All right, well, New passengers. York says they're doing just that. In fact, the health commissioner says Sweden drinks are responsible for half the increase in the city obesity rates over the last 30 years. The mayor's aides say they have the legal authority to do this because they have the authority to look at local eating establishments at uh, the same oversight as they do when they put a rating on a restaurant of whether or not it's clean or sanitary. Mother Bloomberg is a megalomaniac. Mm -hmm. If she thinks that she can take away the free choices of adults, of individuals, and make those choices for us, he lacks that authority under the okay. Constitution and under the laws that govern him. You say he doesn't have that. But what's stopping him, really? Would a legal case have to come in? What would actually stop him from doing this? The, the beverage industry would file a, a for an injunction before a federal court and this will be enjoined before it ever becomes law and it will never see the light of day that's how obviously meantime, unconstitutional it is you want to stock up on your 20 ounce bottles just in case judge i'll check your office later and see if you have just i a have a, i have stash. a couple of 32 <laughs> ounces up there for you does he think he can change people's tastes <laughs> and what they will drink and what they will buy well, Come on, Mike, you got more important things here to Here we do. go. All right, Judge, thank you very much for that. We'll continue to see. We'll see if the, I mean, obviously. The from our, from my perspective, it's a fascinating legal case. Well, we're glad you're fascinated by it because we are as well, and now a little thirsty, Judge. I'm telling thank you, though, you. that 16 ounces looks awfully it small. Looks, we obviously have no portion of control at all. Judge Napolitano, thank you very much. John, I mean, weren't you surprised, John, 16 I, ounces I say, small? I say 15 ounce Containers and free refills. <laughs> That's How about right, that? free refills always. <laughs> It is 3.54 p.m. here in the East, about an hour away from the close, the normal close of business in the federal courts, and the jury in the John Edwards case is continuing its deliberations under orders from the judge. Our senior judicial analyst is Judge Andrew Napolitano, and Judge, the question, you know, for you now is whether this verdict uh, if they ultimately reach, reach one on all of the counts is somehow in jeopardy because of what we've seen happen today or is the whole process in jeopardy given that the judge has sent the alternate jurors home now and some of these other jurors have already said that they've got events they need to attend and other things they need to do. Everything that the judge has done so far that, that we've been talking about and that you encompassed in your question, Megan, is within her discretion. She decided to send the, uh, the ultimates home. She didn't do it for some uh, nefarious or, or a prejudicial reason. I don't think she should have, but she did. She must have had a feeling there would be a verdict today. Turns out she was a little premature on that. Yes, yeah, she was very premature. And on second thought, you know, on, on hindsight for her, she shouldn't have done it. If one of the jurors becomes incapacitated, doesn't show up, leaves, refuses to uh, participate in the deliberation, she'll have to bring back one of the uh, one of the alternates. And the 11 who deliberated and the one who will join them must begin anew from the beginning, as if no deliberation had occurred, and start all over again. Oh. That, that, that is a, a, a matter that she really hopes doesn't happen, because that's ripe for a mistrial or a reversal on conviction. Uh, if, if that can, happens. Can, by the way, we believe that John Edwards is still inside the courthouse. Can I get your take, Judge, with, with a minute left in the show? Can I get your take on what this trial was about and where we stand really today? In my view, the trial was about whether John Edwards is a good person or a bad person. He's a bad person. He's a bum. He's morally reprehensible. But I don't think that he should have been indicted for these crimes. The law is too ambiguous. It was not written to cover this, uh, this uh, scenario, and he shouldn't be a, a defendant at this time. If he is convicted, it will be because the government succeeded in painting him as utterly unworthy of respect and worthy of some sort of official societal condemnation. Mm -hmm. But that, in my view, would be wrong. 
As some of the analysts uh, and even I think the defense attorneys argued, if you're going to put people in jail for having affairs and then lying about it, you're going to have a lot of clogged up court systems. The prosecution maintains it's about much more than that, a violation of the law and the public trust. I thank all of my legal panelists for their help today. What is next now for Edwards? Let's ask the judge. Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Nice Bill, to see you this evening. Nice Reaction first from you is what? The uh, government lost its best case. Uh, that is, the, the charge on which he was found not guilty was the one for which the government had its strongest case, its most credible witnesses, and introduced the most evidence. So it's a bad day for the government. Now, nobody likes a, a, a non-decision. You don't know where it's going to go from here, and I can tell you how they'll get there. But it's a victory for uh, Senator Edwards and a resounding defeat for the government. You had nine days of deliberations now. The verdict is in. One report unconfirmed tonight that the Justice Department will not try him again. That, would, that would make sense for some of the reasons that I just uh, articulated. This was their strongest shot, and they lost it. Taking a step deeper into the case, Bill, the, the judge ruled in favor of the government in almost every contested issue in the case. She gave the government great latitude. She barred certain defense witnesses from uh, testifying. She even used an instruction to the jury that the government suggested. All of this within her discretion, but basically saying to the government, this is your best shot. How could you possibly think you can do it again? Wow. The wise uh, people in the Justice Department in Washington are probably counseling against a retrial. You think the government screwed this up? Yes. I think the government should not have charged him with this crime. I think this is an ambiguous statute. I think, if I may, Bill, it's an intentionally ambiguous statute because it's been written by politicians to govern politicians. And they intentionally use language which was vague about what you can do with money. It's actually unclear whether or not the events in which John Edwards engaged, if they happened as the government says they did, even constituted a crime under this statute. So then the jurors, they get it right? The jurors did the right thing. A long, tortuous process for them with thousands of documents for them uh, to review. I think they did uh, the right thing, and then they basically said to the judge, we can't make up our minds on the rest of it. It's in your hands. We heard from John Edwards today, um, talking perhaps for the longest time that we've heard in some time. Was that a smart idea for him to talk? I'll give you both arguments. He could antagonize the prosecutors by making statements to the public that he didn't make in the courtroom where they could cross-examine him. On the other hand, he made statements which were good for everybody to hear. He basically said, I didn't commit a crime, but I did horrible things and I take responsibility for it and I'll have to live with it for the rest of my life. That makes people feel good. Who does it make feel good? The potential jurors in a second trial, should there be one. All this talk about a juror flirting with John Edwards, that doesn't matter now, does it? No, it doesn't matter. If it happened, it was addressed quite properly by the judge in, in her chambers, so we don't know about it. I think it might have been sort of the myth about uh, John Edwards, but of course, I wasn't in the courtroom. Judge, nice to see you. Thank Pleasure, you. Bill. Andrew Napolitano here with Thank his you. reaction tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, President Obama campaigned in 2008 to close Gitmo and outlaw torture. But a recent report in the New York Times a couple of days ago reveals the president has a top secret kill list, a roster of people suspected of terror targeted for execution by drone. President Obama made clear from the start to his advisors and to the world that we were going to take whatever steps are necessary to protect the American people from harm and particularly from a terrorist attack. At the same time, the president also made clear from the outset of his administration that we were at all times going to act in a manner that was both lawful and consistent with our values. Okay, but is it lawful? Let's talk to Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge, you say no. No. He's breaking the law. He's absolutely breaking the law. This killing business is extremely dangerous stuff. The president can only kill in accordance with the Constitution and federal law. So what does the Constitution say? He can only kill using the military <clears throat> if the United States has been attacked and he's repelling the attackers. If the United States is about to be attacked, the attack is certain, and it would be foolish to wait for them to shoot first right. or pursuant to a declaration of war. He can only kill using civilian employees of the military if it's a legitimate execution after a jury verdict of death that's been upheld on appeal. Right. So none of these situations applies. This president is waging a private war 
using non-military employees of the government. He is personally, according to this report in the New York right. Times, a chilling 6,000 word report. He is personally deciding who to kill. He doesn't have that authority. He could be prosecuted for it by a successor, and the people who carry out the killing could be prosecuted for violating federal law against murder. You know what? It sounds like the New York Times editorial page agrees with you. Yesterday they had an op-ed that said this president is, no president should have this power. This president has too much power when he does that. When he sits around on Terror Tuesdays, goes through the baseball cards, decides, okay, this guy's going to die. Uh, how much collateral damage and, and other people might go with him? The president decides who lives and dies. The president has argued that his careful deliberations of who lives and dies is an adequate substitute for the due process, a jury trial right. that the Constitution requires, or a declaration of law that the Constitution mandates. That's nonsense. No court has ever upheld that. You want to know how chilling this is? You know who David Axelrod is, the president's campaign chairman? He's been invited to these meetings at which the president decides who to kill. Does he have security clearance? Why would he, well, the president can give him security okay. clearance, but why would he be there to assure that the killings are politically correct? Come on, this is so far from the country that the founders gave us that they would not recognize this president as the president of the United States of America. Judge Andrew Napolitano, damning words. Good to see you, Steve. All right, thank you, sir.